What's up, Degenerate Nation? Welcome to the Big Bets on Campus podcast presented by BetMGM. This is the week seven college football betting preview. I'm Stucky and joining me, as always, is my VBOC co-host, Colin Wilson. Colin, we're getting into the Saturdays where uh, we're going to get separation every single week amongst the top teams couple more key games we'll get to you excited for this slate i'm excited just for weather alone in the month of october because people just feel like the forecast is going to have rain in it you see the totals drop but really they don't understand that it's wind cross landscape orientation like i mean there just goes so much more than waking up on sundays and mondays and whacking totals down to nothing because there might be precip i very interesting how totals end up this weekend yeah a lot of times early in the week those are just If there's even a hint of weather, those are going to get hit. So, I mean, a lot of times what people do is they'll say, you know, you'll have people that are just taking positions on, okay, if it is weather, I'm going to get a good number here. If not, I can always buy back and just juice out. But it is hard to predict the weather, you know, a week out. And sometimes these things don't come to fruition. Recall the, remember the hurricane effect for the, UConn, FIU, BC, Florida State. Remember those totals crashed, and then you watch the games, and there, there's no weather impact. So, yeah, mm-hmm. Mother Nature, like college football, not the easiest thing to predict. Before we get into our three marquee matchups, just want to remind everyone that the BBOC podcast is presented by BetMGM. Use bonus code ACTION when signing up to get up to $1,500 paid back in bonus bets if your first bet loses. For new users in Arizona, Colorado, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, let's get in to our three marquee games, and then we're going to get to, I think, eight rapid fire. I have a ton of trash. And then we'll obviously cover Friday Night Lights, our favorite overdogs and underdogs at the end of the show, as always. Uh, But let's start off in the SEC in a matchup between Texas A&M and Tennessee. Tennessee is a, I think they're now a three-point favorite. Over-under is sitting at 55 and a half. Interesting thing about this game is Tennessee at home, electric crowd. They have the fourth longest home streak in the nation. And Texas A&M, the road has not treated them kindly of late. I think they've lost like 14 to 15 against ranked opponents on the road. The last road one came against, I believe, Missouri in 2021. True road game. So Tennessee's obviously going to have a hyped crowd here. The spot favors the Vols because you have Tennessee coming off of a bye. Come in here fresh. They, you know, they got some guys back. I think they might get their starting cornerback. They got Cooper Mays back at center. Defensive tackle came back against South Carolina as well and got, I think, you know, 10 to 15 snaps. So they're getting healthier on along the offensive line and on defense. And meanwhile, Texas AM is coming off a just a heartbreaking loss to Alabama in a game that they just fumbled the bag. I mean, a- Alabama was trying to give them the game. They wouldn't take it. Jimbo Fisher, terrible calls. And that pretty much puts them out of the SEC race uh, because of that straight up loss to Alabama. And now they have two losses on the year. So how do they bounce back here? That is a major question from a matchup perspective. You know, Tennessee looks a lot different than last year. They are a heavy, heavy run team. And they've had a lot of success doing it with a three-headed monster of Wright, Small, and Sampson, who are all averaging over six yards per carry. And now you got Mays back at center. So they they really want to run a lot. Defense looks improved, but they really haven't faced many competent offenses this year. Even against UTSA, they were facing their backup quarterback. The run defense looks legit. It was pretty good last year. If you take away a 75-yard run against South Carolina, they had like 26 carries for 70 yards. Florida, despite the win, Really didn't do that much on the ground. There, I still have some questions in the Tennessee secondary. So from a matchup perspective, this actually sets up well for Texas a in my opinion. 
because they've been great against the run. Their run defense has been phenomenal, and that's what Tennessee wants to do. You can attack their secondary, but now no Brew McCoy in that receiving core that lost two receivers to the NFL. And Joe Milton, unlike Jalen Milrow, who has elite numbers throwing the deep ball, he's just 8 of 30 on balls thrown 20-plus yards downfield. So can he really exploit the Texas A&M defense? On the other side of the ball, it's all about can Texas A&M – and Texas A&M starting to get more pressure too. Uh, Durkin is blitzing more. But on the other side of the ball, can Texas A&M – I don't think they're going to be able to run the ball much against this Tennessee D, but I think there's going to be opportunities in the passing game as long as Max Johnson has enough time. Texas A&M offensive line has been a problem. Tennessee's getting a decent amount of pressure, even if it's not against the toughest schedule. The other thing I worry about, too, is neither of these teams have been great finishing drives. Texas A&M is moving the ball up and down the field, but their run game has been bad, so they haven't really been punching in the end zone. Unfortunately for me, they, uh, for us last week, they couldn't get in from the one-yard line to cover that game. Tennessee also, despite a really good run game, hasn't been great finishing drives. So ultimately, when I look at this game, uh, I think that Texas A&M has solid matchup advantages on both sides of the ball. But the spot really favors Tennessee. Can Texas A&M come out here with a focused effort on the road uh, in a hostile environment and pick up the win? What do you see here? We should just blindly be playing spots, right? I mean, it is a part of the handicap, but I cannot get over how much I do not like this Tennessee team. Just a massive difference in strength of schedule here. Texas A&M at 12, Tennessee at 104th. You know, there, there. you mentioned all of the advantages that there are for Texas A&M in here, but – you know, unlike Bama, Tennessee does have a top 10 Havoc allowed rank, meaning they don't let a lot of teams get behind the line of scrimmage. They don't have a lot of interceptions, a lot of PBUs. They don't make a lot of mistakes. But I go back, like the schedule that they faced is just so soft. So you have to ask, is Texas A&M going to get as many freebies when it comes to field position, creating Havoc that they did against Alabama? Tennessee rolled South Carolina and UTSA for three possessions, but I, somehow – they rank 125th in pass explosives. You couldn't have told me preseason that no matter how good or bad Joe Milton was, the Tennessee was going to be 125th in pass explosives. Uh, and that's how you beat AM. That's how you beat AM. And, and so when you go deeper into Joe Milton's numbers, nine to three TD to INT, but he's six to five in big time throws a turnover worthy plays, the largest average depth of target drop of his career. Last year, he was 51% adjusted completion rate. On passes over 20 yards, this year it's 33%. He's terrible. Milton, he likes quarters. He likes cover three. He has a high success rate. The efficiency really drops off when he goes up against cover one. Texas a and is pretty good in all three. They do run cover one. They run cover three quarters. So I believe they'll probably run more cover one because that is what's given Milton so many problems. But I can't get over the fact that the schedule that this Tennessee team has had on offense, they're 95th in quality drives and 61st in finishing drives. Those were cupcakes. Those were just walks in the park. Now, to your right, Texas A&M is struggling to score themselves. Jimbo's overriding fourth and one calls, red zone calls. Jimbo taking control of the wheel over Petrino is what's really caused some of these numbers to happen. I project this game at two. I bought Texas A&M at four on open. I would buy them again at three. I'm going to ignore the spot because I have so many problems with Tennessee's offense. I mean, if you're not throwing deep and you're trying to be this grounded pound, that's just not who you are, volunteers. And Texas A&M plays right into what Texas A&M wants to do. So I'm going to be with the Aggies. Hopefully they rebound off the Bama loss. And maybe Jimbo will just swallow all his papers and let Petrino call the full game. Yeah, I, I'm going to have, because of the spot, I mean, I'm not too far off this line. I do like the matchup for A&M. It, it really comes down to do they come out here fired up so because of that, I, I'm gonna I'm probably gonna have AM in a round robin um as a small dog. And I actually like the under at over 55. Yeah. This Tennessee offense is not the same as it's been. And I still think they're, you know, the market is pricing this Tennessee offense as having some explosive passing attack, but it's not there. The accuracy isn't there for Milton. They want to run the ball. AM can defend the run. And AM's having trouble in the red zone. And they can't really run. I think there's gonna be a lot of field goals in this game. Like I, I think that both teams can will be able to have some success moving the ball, but I think they're both going to continue struggling to finish drives. So uh, I think that this the under has a bit of value. I'm going to be on that small. That's Texas, A&M's whole, that's Texas A&M's whole season, 13th in offensive quality drives. They get down the field, but when they get into scoring position, they're vanilla. Yep. And they're struggling to run the ball, and, and the play calling has been bad uh, 
especially on those late downs where, yeah, I think Fisher's taking control. All right, let's move on to the biggest game of the day. We're going to head to the Pac-12, where Washington will host Oregon. Washington is a three-point favorite here over under 67 and a half. If you recall last year, a thriller was 37-34. Washington won in Eugene. Bo Nix got hurt in that game for a stretch, which really cost Oregon, and Washington capitalized late. It's Washington has a couple, the both teams are coming off of a bye. So we'll see what tricks they have up their sleeves and schematic changes. Will Washington has some more, more injury concerns in Oregon. We will see if Asa Turner, their safety's back. McMillan, their wide receiver. Adunze also got banged up the end of the last game. And then they're, they're really good defensive tackle too, who I think they need. Uh, he's worth monitoring as well. We'll see if Washington can get those guys back. You do have road bow next here which you always have to bring up where historically he just hasn't been as great in his career than when he's playing at home. When I look at this game, just from afar, I don't think that the, I think the line is pretty close to right. I've had these teams pretty equal and then you throw in home field advantage. But when I still have questions, I have more questions about the Washington defense than I do the Oregon defense. And if you watch Oregon this year, they, you know, they're getting a pass rush, which was lacking last year. And they just have better overall personnel to run what Lanning wants to run. They're, they're now more multiple. They're more, com they're running more complex stuff in his scheme. He has two weeks to prepare for this. So, and I don't, I, you know, I don't think Washington's going to have much success running the ball. I think Oregon can throw off the timing. This Washington offense is all about timing. I think they can throw off the timing a bit. And what I think this game ultimately comes down to, I think Oregon's going to win. Now, trusting Roadbo Nix is tough. But what I think this game comes down to is I do think Oregon has an advantage in the trench when they're on offense with their offensive line. I think they're going to be able to run the ball. And this game's going to – the margins are going to be thin. But all of the third and fourth and shorts, I think Oregon's going to get. Washington's really struggled to stop those. And Oregon has the advantage up front, and they can rely on their ground game to convert those. Whereas Washington will have to be more reliant on throwing the ball on those third and fourth downs. And I think Oregon will force, you know, get some pressure, maybe force a couple key in incompletions. Additionally, I think Oregon might have just a few more successful trips in the red zone as far as converting those trips into sevens than Washington. Because Washington's going to move, they can move the ball up and down the field. One of the best offenses, look, three potential pro receivers, the Heisman front runner at quarterback. When they have space to operate, they're very difficult to defend. But when the field condenses, it becomes a little more difficult. Whereas Oregon, with their rushing attack, I think that they can have a bit more success in getting those sevens in the red zone. So I think that's what's going to be the difference. I think the line is pretty spot on. I mean, I don't think you're going to find many people that are like, I have this team way ahead of this other team. So, you know, these are two pretty evenly matched teams from a power rating standpoint, at least from my perspective. And then you throw in home field. And that's why you're, that's what you're seeing here. Like this line was two and a half. Then you, you have people that wanted to buy uh, Washington at home. Then you had three. Someone said, look, you have some people out there that said, these teams are pretty even. Maybe you have Oregon a little head. I'll happily take the field goal especially if you like some matchup advantages. What do you see here in Washington, Oregon, a game that will have massive implications for the Heisman race, the Pac-12 race, the national championship and college football playoff as well. What do you see? Yeah, I echo everything that you said. These are two different offenses in the way that they get down the field. I mean, they're number one and number two in quality drives. You can't say anything about these two offenses. You can't say anything negative about these two offenses and how they operate. But they are two different animals. Oregon has been extremely good running the ball and having rush explosives as to where Washington, the big play, usually comes all the way through the air. And, you know, no other offenses in the entire nation has less penalties, less missed field goals, interceptions, fumbles. Every drive is 50 yards. Every drive ends in some sort of score. But the glaring weakness is the yeah, like Bo Nix has, like, no turnover with early plays, but he's also, like, just not making risky as risky of downfield throws as last year. 
Yeah, I mean, that's what's crazy. I'll get to his rushing stats, which kind of blow me away. But, you know, the glaring weakness here is the Washington rush defense. And you have to ask yourself, is Bo Nix going to get involved with that? Right now, Bucky Irving, Jordan James, Noah Whittington, they're all averaging at least 3.5 yards after contact. They've combined for 26 explosive runs. You know, Bucky Irving being the one that creates the more missed tackles. James, you know, really leads the team seven TDs. He's the bruiser. But where's Bo Nix? He's not running this year. Is he being saved for this game or is he just not needed to because they have a great stable of running backs? Or maybe it's because he had a high ankle sprain last season that kept him out of so many games late. And maybe Lanning thought that would have got him over the hump for the Pac-12. He's had seven rushing attempts on the season. That's a comparison to 66 last year. So I don't know if they just unleash him here, especially with these really poor Washington rush metrics on defense. The one thing I keep coming back, and Washington, you know, they're they're more explosive, top rank in the country and big play rate. They lead the nation in 10, 20, and 30-yard passes. So there's no doubt that they're going to be able to get down the field. But what do you do if you're Dan Lanning? Do you decide to lean into your run, shorten the game, and keep the hand and keep the ball out of the hands of Michael Penix? Kind of think that might be the answer here because the running backs have been unbelievable. Washington hasn't been able to stop that. Games against Arizona and Cal. I mean, that Cal game was a little bit hidden because they got such a huge lead at the beginning. You didn't really see some of the advanced metrics in there that say that Cal could run the ball all over this Washington defense. So ultimately, I have money down now on Oregon team total over 32 and a half. I want to play Oregon plus three. I'm a little bit nervous about the number of points in this game because if Dan Landing decides – we're going to take the ball. We're going to play keep away. We're going to go time of possession, abuse this rush defense of Washington and not let Penix on the field. This is going to be a lower scoring game and Oregon's going to control the trench. So I'm with you. I, I haven't bet Oregon plus three, but I know I'm heading there. I know I'm on my way. Yeah. I'm, because of the matchup advantage is my intuition along with A&M, Oregon is going to be in my round robin. Um, I, I, I actually like the under here. Um, it's scary, but what you said, I think Oregon is going to be methodical, is going to control the clock, especially with the new clock rules. Like last year was 37 34, but new clock rules this year, both defenses are a little better than last year. But you got to remember last year, both defenses were really bad. Um, and so I think Washington, Oregon's going to control the clock here, keep the ball out of Washington's hands. And then on the other side, when Washington has the ball, I think Oregon's defense is significantly improved. I think Landing's going to have a good game plan here. They're going to be able to get some pressure. And in the red zone, I think they're going to make some stops and force some field goals. It just becomes much more difficult for Washington, which is, you know, moves the ball with such ease with those 10, 20, 30 yard gains. But you can't really do that when the field shrinks. So and then throw in some weather. You know, this, there could be some weather in Seattle and Washington. While they're a high power passing attack, they're not fast. They're they're slow um, as far as their number of seconds it takes to run plays. So um They're, one team is superior like one team is superior on passing downs defense by far from a success rate and limiting explosives and it's Oregon so yeah yeah I think Oregon's gonna win this game it's gonna be super close the one thing that could swing it in Washington's favor is does road bow next make a couple key boneheaded turnovers I got a guy on Twitter that keeps telling me that's all Auburn base. It's not Oregon base. Quit talking about it on the podcast. I'm going to do some deep dives on the Bo Nix Pac-12 road road games. I mean, look, he arguably they should have lost at Texas Tech. Yeah. Which people forget, uh, which seems like two months ago. All right. Good stuff there. Oh, by the way, here, here's a question for you. It's, it's hypothetical. It's hard to project what the, what the fuck's going to happen in this crazy, awesome college football season. But in the past, when you have dominant dominant SEC, right, like with two or three elite teams, when they played each other early, midway through the year, you would say, okay, the loser of this game is not eliminated from the college football playoff, right? Because you could go on to be a one-loss SEC champ, and then you still are going to get into the college football playoff. I don't – look, there's, there's human bias – in who goes to the college football playoff with the committee. And that's just the way that it is. But I feel like with how deep the Pac-12 is this year, the loser of this game shouldn't necessarily be eliminated from the college football playoff picture. In the past, the Pac-12, like once you lose a game, it's like, all right, you're done. Uh, you pretty much had to run the table and win the Pac-12. But I don't think the loser of this game is eliminated. It might even be a chance 
to buy one of them, depending on the futures price, because then if they go on to win out, like say Oregon wins, if Washington wins out, which, you know, they, they play USC and they knock them off and then say Washington beats Oregon on a neutral to win the Pac-12, could see them still getting in. Would you agree with that? Uh, here's what's going through my head. Would you rather have a national title future on Oregon or Washington as a one loss or Ohio state undefeated right now? And my answer is either of the PAC 12 teams over Ohio state. So I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I would, I don't, maybe it's my hate for Ohio state right now, but I, I, I think these PAC 12 teams are full of quality and can rumble with some of the big boys in the SEC and the big 10. Yeah. I think that because I think Oregon's going to win. If you like Oregon national title future, I would buy it now. If you like Washington, um, it might be if Oregon wins this game, we'll talk about that next week. We'll see where they sit and what else happens this weekend, including a game involving another Pac-12 team. USC will head to South Bend to take on Notre Dame. Notre Dame, I believe, is playing its fourth straight primetime game and fourth straight game against a ranked opponent for the, I think the fourth straight primetime, it's first time in program history, four straight ranked, fourth time in program history. This team has to be exhausted. That's the number one question. Now, you get to come home and, I, you know, by the way, if they beat Ohio State and then they beat, they, they steal that game against Duke, I think they'd have a much they might have won that game at Louisville, right? They were exhausted. and But if you're undefeated, right, it, your kids, it's easier to get up for that. However, I'll tell you why maybe that's not true, because last week was a disaster for Notre Dame. And by the way, the, the, the every time you see Notre Dame now come out, Ohio State looks worse. And every time you see Ohio State, they look worse. Like, Ohio State should have lost to Notre Dame. So Notre Dame last week goes to Louisville, obviously just at the end of a gauntlet, the schedule that started off in Ireland. For what it's worth, Notre Dame does lead the country in points scored per game overseas, if you're curious. Um, they do they lead the country of scoring in Ireland. Um, but last week they go to Louisville and we talked about it. The spot was awful. Uh so that they lost. Is it surprising that they lost? No. But how it happened, yes. Uh so what Elko did two weeks ago is he just said, we're loading the box and we're going to force you to beat us with your receivers and we're going to take away the run. Louisville did the same thing. Nine in the box. We're not going to let you run. And your receivers who are underwhelming and or hurt, kind of flashed early in the season against an underwhelming schedule, haven't been great of late. And Gerard Parker has deteriorated. I don't know what's going on with the play calling. Most curious of all, they decided we're gonna we're gonna be like a an an NBA team that subs five in and five. We're gonna just sub our offensive linemen all game. We're gonna have an offensive line rotation in the interior, and they were subbing in and out guys. Maybe they were worried about the fatigue. The results were disastrous. I, I, I'm not a fan of that. Offensive line is all about continuity. Right. Reading the D like uh, what the I don't know what they were doing. The play calling was also horrible. They didn't adjust at all to what Louisville was doing and what Duke did the week before. And it led to five turnovers um, and a loss. So now you fast forward to the and then meanwhile, our, USC shot lost to Arizona. Go for two. Jesus. Uh, USC has been playing with their food because their defense stinks. But if you look back to last year. USC's defense also was horrible, but against Notre Dame. They pretty much said, we're going to stop the run, load the box. We're able to do so. And um, that's the handicap here. Notre Dame's defense has been good, right? And they their secondary is good. They've been put in some compromised situations due to the offense of late. The defense is good, but you're not going to completely slow down this USC attack. So I assume that USC is going to come in here and they're going to say, we're going to stop the run. We've seen what... Although, who knows with this UFC defensive staff, they'll probably sit, uh, drop eight and let Notre Dame run for 300. Um, but they, if if they have a brain, they'll just go to load the box, and no matter how bad they've been playing, and their run defensive stats are awful. You have that many guys in the box, you can stop it. Anyone can stop. Most teams can stop the run. It leaves you exposed on the outside. But Notre Dame, 
hasn't proved that they can do anything about that. And USC is at least getting pressure, getting into the backfield. So two questions I have for you before you share your thoughts. One, like, can, can we expect Notre Dame, and the weather might help Notre Dame here if it is windy and rainy. Can we expect Notre Dame, or should we expect Notre Dame to be up for this game after this stretch? Like, or are they just going to be so fatigued? Like, it is at home against USC, but are they going to, and they've been wearing down in the second half of games. Um, and then two, can we expect USC, like they did last year, to just take away this Notre Dame rush attack, which, if you do, seems to just completely hamper the Irish offense? What do you see here? Notre Dame's a three, two, yeah, two and a half, three point favorite here for what it's worth. Yeah. I mean, Notre Dame lost 38 27 last year out in LA. Um, <laughs> A little bit of a surprising outcome there, but uh, you know, you, you wonder if the revenge factor is being talked about by Marcus Freeman in this spot, or the fact that Sam Hartman, who you know might have uh, hopes of winning the Heisman, is going up against the reigning Heisman winner. So there should be plenty of motivation here. Plus, you're off of a loss, so I would think Notre Dame has all the motivation here, and hopefully Freeman practices them light and tells them all to get ten hours of sleep in bed and enjoy being in that nice cold. South Bend weather uh, with some rain coming in, which I think completely helps Notre Dame here, especially Audric Estime, um, you know, getting through the USC defensive front seven. He averages 4.4 yards after contact. He's created a ton of missed tackles. And right now, USC is 111th in tackle grading. So you can see, you know, there's one stat that uh, Sports Info Solutions puts out, which is broken tackle rate. And USC just is arm tackling university is what they should be called. So... Uh, are they going to load the box? Maybe because Audrick estimate looks like they could absolutely bulldoze this defense. And if not, then the expectation is that Sam Hartman's going to be able to throw all over the USC defense. This Trojans defense. I don't know if I should go through all the stats. I mean, you gave up 41 to Arizona, 41 to Colorado, 28 to San Jose state, 28 to Arizona state. Um, you know, Hartman has struggled with, with uh, cover one so far this year, but USC is pretty mediocre and success rate with cover one. And they only run it about 16% of the time. So we're going to see if that back seven has enough, which they haven't shown me anything. And passing downs are 99th in success rate. They're 106th in limiting explosives in passing down. So I think even if Hartman gets behind the chains and off schedule, he's going to be able to connect on a lot of passes. He's got, I think, Great House and some of the other wide receivers are healthier this week. Uh, hopefully they go back to just a rotation of five on the offensive line. I think on the other side of the ball, like, you know, with Caleb Williams, is he going to be able to escape the pass rush? And I think you're going to see a lot of Caleb Williams doing that little spin move outside the tackle box once he gets pressure, because Notre Dame is 15th in pass rush. They're ninth in pressures created of all of all FBS teams. And right now, Notre Dame is swatting everything out of the air. They have six INTs and they have 25 PBUs. So, uh, you know, they're a very aggressive. Yeah, two really good corners, which helps in this game. Two good corners. So you got to watch over the middle where, where Caleb is probably going to look or, or comebacks. And, you know, Notre Dame lives in cover one about 41 percent of the time. 20% of the time they're in cover three. So if you go into Caleb's metrics over the past two years, he's got a sub success rate against cover one and cover three. He thrives against quarters, which absolutely makes sense for how much he gets outside the tackle box and what he sees down the field. Notre Dame runs quarters like less than 10% of the time. They are over 60% in cover one, cover three, where Caleb has some problems. I mean, he has a high EPA. It doesn't matter what the coverage is. Caleb can throw high explosives, but he is not moving the chains and being as successful against cover one and cover three. And for that reason, I like Notre Dame because of the ground game. I like Notre Dame because of the weather. I like Notre Dame because of the coverage they show on defense. Uh, rain, wind, bring it. I don't care. Clear skies. I do project it. What's keeping me from making this a monster bet is the fact that I do power rate this at Notre Dame minus two and a half. So, you know, it's not like there's a huge discrepancy, but I really like the Irish in this game. I think they bounce back clean. Yeah, The by the way, the, there's... The, the receivers are going to have to to make some plays, and I was I was reading, um, on a message board. It was an article in the comments section, and Stucky was getting roasted. I felt like it was my uh, my Twitter timeline after a college football or basketball Saturday. People just saying Stucky's a fraud. Stucky's got to go. Uh, and Stucky's a fraud. Stucky's got to go. Stucky doesn't know what he's doing. But when they're obviously referring to Chancey Stucky, the wide receivers coach for Notre Dame, but it was right. I was reading it, it just kept saying Stucky's a fraud. Who Stucky's got to go. Um, but should be an interesting one in South Bend. 
sets Notre Dame does have, even if their defense steps up, their offense is going to have to move the ball because the one thing that I worry about, you know, with USC going fast is that if they're not at least sustaining some drives and having success on the ground where the fatigue could come in against this USC offense is in the second half with that defense, right? You're going up against that. So it's good. Notre Dame is going to have to sustain drives because of that. I think Notre Dame's defense is going to show up well here. And I think Notre Dame is going to try to run the ball. Their offensive line should play better this week. I assume they're just going to pick five guys and go with them. So with the weather too, I know this totals come down, but again, I, I lean under here at 60 and a half. I think under and Notre Dame are pretty correlated. So before we move on, Stuck, we're brought to you today by Manscaped, who's taken a step up from Balloween to bring your face the cleanest shave it's ever seen. So this season, no need to toil in trouble. Manscaped's all-new handyman is the best way to get rid of that stubble. Featuring a compact design and next-gen skin-safe technology, the handyman was designed to give you that smooth finish without the mess of a traditional shave. Get the sweetest treat this Halloween by going to manscaped.com and use code BBOC for 20% off, plus free shipping. Halloween costumes might take effort, but beer grooming doesn't need to with the handyman. Get 20% off free shipping and the code BBOC at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code BBOC. For a look at for a look as sweet as candy, get yourself the handyman from Manscaped. Halloween. Halloween. Uh, uh, all right, let's move on to a little rapid fire. Let's hit. We're gonna hit on eight games of, I think, pretty widespread interest. Let's uh, let's start in the ACC. Syracuse off of uh, two straight losses, two straight blowout losses to Clemson and North Carolina. They sit now at four and two on the season. They head to Florida State, who is now five and zero oh on the season. They have host Duke next. Does Florida State, Johnny Wilson is questionable, their star receiver who left last week's game with an injury. Can Syracuse bounce back here is this a buy low spot on the orange who just haven't fared well when they've stepped up in class so far this season they're catching 17 and a half in tallahassee noon eastern on abc see anything here yeah i took 18 on open with syracuse because i made the number 12 i'm sorry 13 i made it florida state minus 13 I took it because Garrett Schrader is going to be healthy, and I just thought that this was a complete overreaction to what happened to Syracuse the previous week. And now I'm starting to wonder, after some comments from Dino Babers made on Monday, I think I might have made the wrong decision here because all he could talk about is we have no depth. We have no depth. So the orange just got – This happens to Syracuse every year. Every – yep, I've got it right here ready to go. I mean, the orange got crushed the last two weeks, 71-21. to Uh you know, I mean, when you look at what UNC did, nine explosive passes, only 10 of their 45 run attempts were stuffed. And, you know, Syracuse did not have, this is what, when I started deep diving this on Monday, Syracuse didn't have a single explosive or methodical drive against UNC. You go the week before, they didn't have a single explosive or methodical drive against Clemson. Uh, and the defense just completely fell off the table against UNC. When you go into the history of Syracuse, they are what we call what, a walking corpse? Huge history of breaking down here. Dino started 6-0 and last year, lost five straight. In 2021, they lost six of their final eight games. In 2020, they lost their final eight games. I mean, there is this monster history of second half, just complete, absolute failure going on by Syracuse. So, you know, I made the bet. FSU struggles to stop explosive runs. That all comes down to Garrett Schrader. Uh, he has more explosive runs than LaQuint Allen. Um, he's made, he's created 10 more missed tackles. He averages more than four yards after contact. And, you know, uh, Schrader in this game last year did not do very well. He had a fumble in this game, six of 17 passing. I have been living for the last four days after making this opening bet, thinking I probably made a mistake here. I think I need to cover it up because Syracuse is a sinking ship. Once this thing gets to October. Miami at North Carolina staying in the ACC. This is all about, to me, the – there's two questions here. One that, that I think we'll get the answer to early on in the game. One, how real is the North Carolina defensive improvement? 
you know, just if you look, first of all, it was hard not to improve from last year. They were so bad. And you know, they just held Syracuse to seven. You know, yeah, Pitt got the 24 on them. Minnesota, who can't score on anybody. <laughs> who cares? South Carolina, you know, they played well out of pass rush in that game. But App State, you know, put up 34 and 500 yards of offense. So I think that some of the numbers might be a bit phony. Drake May, obviously one of the best quarterbacks in the country, who also got Tez Walker back at receiver last week. Uh, so we'll see how real. You know, I don't think anything, anyone's saying that this UNC defense is really good, but they're definitely improved. How much? Still unsure there. The other question we'll have answered is, how, how will Miami bounce back? They obvi- they lost one of the most heartbreaking games that I can ever remember. The game's in, in the bag. All you got to do is take a knee, and you don't, and then you give up a, a big pass and a bomb and lose at the bell in a game that you were basically on the sidelines being like, all right, we're on to Carolina, we're undefeated, just emotionally. And then, you know, you have all these kids crying after. How does Mario Cristobal keep the locker room intact? keep them focused and have them show up for this road game. That's what makes this tough for me. Um, I'll probably have Miami in a round Robin because if they do show up, I think this number has some value on Miami, which has looked good. I think they'll be able to run the ball here to set up the pass. Van Dyke had some bad throws last week, but he still had a, a pretty good year overall and has looked a lot better in this offense. And I think the Miami defense has more talent. So I'll probably throw them in a round robin because there's also a chance like if they just don't show up and they're flat, they could get run out here. And then their season just goes into a tailspin. But know a couple people close to the program and from some of the quotes that I've read, I've I've liked what I've heard about them bouncing back and not, you know, crystal ball taking accountability. And for what it's worth, when we lost money on that game against Stanford, when he did the same exact fucking thing, and they fumbled when they just could have taken a knee. What happened to that Oregon team? The next week they beat a ranked Cal team. So they did bounce. Cristobal was able to right the ship, which, you know, sample size of one. But uh, <laughs> that's all we have to go off of. So, yeah, I have a lot of questions about Miami's, you know, just psychological state. And still trying to figure out how – much improved this UNC defense is. It's improved. I don't think it's drastically improved. But I think this number's gotten a little bit too high because of what happened to Miami last week. Maybe that's fair. But uh, I think Miami's a good round-robin candidate because they do show up. I think there's some some value in this money line. What do you see here with UNC and Miami? Oh, I completely agree. Like, I went down the same path as you. Like, that Oregon... When that happened in 2018, I went to see what happened afterwards. They beat Cal 42 to 24. The point spread was three and a half in that game. So they easily. Yeah, Cal was ranked 24th yeah. the, at the time. Yeah. And then they followed up the next week by beating Washington. So Cristobal did not lose the locker room in Oregon when that happened. And that was my big worry was like, are you going to lose the Miami locker room? Now, considering the boosters, the AD, they all shelled out a blank check to Cristobal to get him to come from Oregon. I I don't think it affects his job safety. Well, I don't I don't know if Cristobal can do anything to affect his job safety, considering how in love everybody is down there with him. You're right. He did come out in the pre- he did come out in his presser and he said I, I should have taken a knee. I mean, he said that flat out. That's got to be hard for a guy like him to say that. Um, so you know, you take ownership of it, you move on, and generally that's how these things get you know put behind you. To me, I want the under in this game. There's a lot of reasons I want the under in this game. UNC has been really poor in defending the rush. They did limit Schrader and Allen of Syracuse last week. Uh, but, you know, they allowed Pitt 5.8 per carry, Minnesota 5.7. You mentioned those teams. UNC has been top 10 limiting pass explosives. or 24th in coverage. So that makes me think there may be some troubles here for Tyler Van Dyke. When I look at the coverage, you know, especially cover one, where Tyler Van Dyke has moderate success rate and average EPA, that's what he's going to see a lot. When you switch over to Drake May on offense for North Carolina, will he torch a Miami coverage unit that ranks 48th and then they're 80th in passing downs EPA allowed? So you would think there's an avenue here for May to get some work in, to go deep in passing downs. But Miami's going to go quarters and cover one. And May has struggled with quarters coverage all his his last two years. He has a negative EPA, no explosive passes, and a 44% success rate, which is about 6% less than national average. So if with quarters coverage... It limits what Drake May could do down the field, or at least his history of that. So I'm taking the under here. I want the steam on the total 
to get down to 59. 59 is a huge key, but there's not going to be any rush explosives for the Hurricanes on offense through the ground or, on, or you know in the air either. And then May struggles with quarters coverage. So for me, this is under all the way. Uh, moving on to the Pac-12, one of the other big games this week, UCLA, Oregon State. We'll see if Dante Moore on the road didn't go too well at UCLA. DJU had his best game throwing the ball last week. UCLA's defensive front, which has been dominating games against that Oregon State offensive line, that's a great matchup in this game. What do you see here? I like the over in this game. Uh, that's kind of interesting saying, Dan, you know, considering Danton Lynn has been a fantastic addition as the DC from the Ravens staff. Uh, he does a 4 2 5 4 3. He mixes in one of the heaviest splits numbers in college football. And Layatu Latu has 28 pressures and 18 hurries. Uh, safety Jalen Davies has four PBUs. So the defense is doing their part. But, you know, all of a sudden, DJU is, we, we knew he was going to be successful and explosive on offense running the ball with Damian Martinez and Deshaun Fenwick. But where did these pass explosives come from? So we're going to see if DJU can replicate that. He destroys cover three. UCLA runs half and half, cover one, cover three. So we'll see if DJU has the explosives again uh, against UCLA secondary. I suspect they're probably not going to run cover three. But opponents are creating explosives on the ground against Oregon State at a massive rate. Beavers are outside the top 100 in tackling. Defensive rushing success rate, they allow 19 first downs a game. So you can be methodical and you can be explosive against this Oregon State defense. I project 63. I like the over. DJU, if he gets to see cover three, he'll have some success in the air. And Dante Moore, I mean, I get it. Everybody's focused on the INTs and the pick sixes, and he looks like a completely green freshman in those. But if you go into the advanced numbers, he's got 15 big-time throws and only six turnover-worthy plays. It just so happens to be the mistakes he made are like leading off Sports Center, and everybody's getting their eyeballs on that. He's actually been pretty good. Uh, so I, I'm, you know, believing that UCLA is going to have a lot of explosives here. They can keep away. And that Washington state score was phony. UCLA should have won they that won by 30. Yeah, absolutely. So I like UCLA in this game and I love the over. Yeah. I was impressed. The question I had going into that game was the UCLA pass defense. They really haven't played a pass passing offense with the pulse and they completely shut down Cam Ward, who was completely lost. So that was a, a nice feather in the cap for the UCLA D, which we knew their front and their run D has been really good. And that's that's how it, that's where everything starts for Oregon State. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to the SEC, this is the disappointment bowl in my backyard in Lexington, Kentucky. Kentucky, two, two and a half point favorite over under 50 and a half will host Missouri. Both teams went into last week undefeated, playing, you know, uh, Dame, you're going to say it again. Both teams went into last weekend undefeated on the season. Missouri took on LSU in a home hype spot. Kentucky traveled down to Athens to take on the number one team in the country. And both now entered this weekend no longer undefeated. Part of this, I think, comes down to who's going to bounce back mentally better. And I just, I also just don't love this matchup for Kentucky because you can't really run on Missouri. You got to attack them downfield and Leary just is too inconsistent early on. You saw it against Georgia. Missed the wide open touchdown. And uh you just can't do that in these games against good teams. You can get away with it early in the season. But uh that's what would worry me here because you can't just line up and rely on Ray Davis in this game. And Kentucky's secondary has some holes that Brady Cook and Burden can potentially exploit. What do you see here? Exactly exactly what you just said. I mean, UK. Kentucky is still number one in rush explosives, despite not recording a single 12 yard gain on Georgia was a little bit shocked by that. And this should be a complete ground game. It looks like in your backyard, you're going to get about a 40% chance of precip. I see at least 10 mile an hour sustained winds and gusts up to 20. But if you look at Commonwealth stadium, it goes at Kroger field, it goes across, uh, not really from end zone to end zone. So that should affect some kicking uh, if you're into the total here. But I just think this is a Missouri play all the way. Brady Cook, despite what happened at the end of that game and LSU covering, 
Brady Cook had four big time throws and three turnover worthy plays. It's just everybody remembers that last <laughs> crushing to the spread uh, pick six that happened. But there are advantages for Missouri here uh, in their passing attack from a success rate and from an EPA perspective. Cook has just destroyed quarters and cover three. The numbers come down against cover one and Kentucky plays 60% in quarters and cover three. So they never play in cover one. So that means that Brady Cook is going to see coverage that he likes to get downfield on. And when you talk about Kentucky being all rush explosives, Ray Davis, 15 of 59 against Georgia. And then they had to rely on Devin Leary, 10 of 26, two TDs. In this game, you're right, Missouri the defense excels on stopping the run seventh in stuff rate 12th in rushing success rate. They limited Jaden Daniels. Like, I mean, that's, it's not easy to do. So, uh, you know, so I'm going to take Missouri here in a bounce box and a bounce back spot. They're going to contain Kentucky's explosive running. Uh, and I think, you know, cook is going to be able to cook because of the coverage that he's going to see. It's what he favors the most. Staying in the sec Auburn at LSU, LSU, down to an 11 and a half point favorite at home over under sitting at 60 Auburn comes off of a buy here after giving Georgia a fight two Saturdays ago LSU meanwhile comes off of that game against Missouri I I sort of have you know from a spot perspective like LSU what do they have left in the tank there could be some fatigue here against an Auburn team coming off the bye. You know, they, they had that game against Arkansas. It finishes 34-31. The next week they play Mississippi. And again, it's 55-49. Last week it's 42-39 in the final minute. Like these are just back and forth games that go right down to the final seconds three weeks in a row. And now you're playing another SEC opponent. And this time one that's coming off the bye. So yep. from a spot perspective, this favors Auburn. The there's, question is, can there's Auburn no do it? Ex- there's no difference between this and what Notre Dame went into Louisville last week. Yep. So the question is, can Auburn's offense, which is extremely limited through the air, we'll see if Freeze, I'm sure there'll be some improvement, some new wrinkles after the bye. He's uh, an amazing schemer. He's two weeks to prepare for this game. Can Auburn's offense do what every other offense does against LSU? Uh, even though they're pretty one-dimensional and score at will. Because if they do, then especially with the spot, then obviously fading this LSU team as a double-digit favorite looks enticing. What do you see here? Yeah, I I mean, this is a huge spot. I think I'm going to bet Auburn here as we're podcasting about it. Uh, It's a game that I make at 10. You have to wonder how many games in a row LSU could just show. Well, their defense hasn't showed up at all. This is the seventh game in a row the LSU offense. Yeah, their defense should be rested. They haven't even done anything. (laughs) Auburn's coming off of a bye week. So you have to ask. I think the first question is because I mean, I've actually had a lot of texts and DMs about this. Is the overtrain going to continue? LSU has been over every single week. And I wonder if this is fine because I make it 60, which is about where we're at in the market. But Auburn's primary attack is the rush with Jarko S. Hunter and Brian Batie. Yeah, this is an under team versus an over team. Something's got to give. Yeah, something's got to give. And if you think that Auburn's going to cover, then you're going to take an under here. But man, is that a scary proposition? So I'm going to veer off and just say, I'm going to take Auburn here. LSU is 110. High correlation in both. Like, Auburn, yeah, Auburn can't cover. Probably can't cover. Win this game if it's if LSU's in in the 40s. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, uh, I think one thing that you're looking at with Auburn, like another reason why you'd like the under, is that there's no explosives. They're 76th in rush EPA. They're 117th in pass EPA. It doesn't matter if it's Peyton Thorne or Robbie Ashford. They're just not getting huge plays in there. And you have to ask, is Jaden Daniels going to overcome a great Auburn secondary? I talked about that with Georgia a couple of weeks ago. It was a big factor into why we wanted to be on the Auburn side. And, you know, Jaden Daniels destroys quarters, cover one and cover three. Auburn lives in quarters and cover three. So we're going to see if those great corners that Auburn has, if they're going to be able to live up here and keep Jaden Daniels when he goes into passing downs, because Auburn should be able to throw a little bit of a wrench in that zone read rushing uh, that, that run type that LSU likes to likes to do. So uh, I, I do like Auburn here. I lean Auburn based on, uh, you know, what LSU's D has done, which is absolutely nothing. Their quality drives and finishing drives rank is 124th in the nation, bottom 10 and in, in allowing teams getting down the field and putting points up on the board. So uh, I think this is a great spot. 
Freeze has multiple options about what he wants to do at quarterback. Jarquez Hunter is going to be able to tear through the middle of this LSU defense. Give me Auburn. Yeah, you got Freeze. Who's amazing game planner, too, with two weeks to prepare, yep. um, which certainly works in Auburn's favor here. All right, let's move to the Mountain West, where Air Force will host Wyoming. Ten and a half point favorites over under down to 42. Both of these teams are undefeated in the Mountain West. I don't know how Wyoming does it. They just keep winning. <laughs> this, But this is no longer in Laradice. I mean, what, they beat Fresno last week, and they beat – they upset Texas Tech earlier in the season, and they've scored – not including overtime, they scored 10 total points in the second half of those games. They didn't score in the second half last week against Fresno, and they won. So, you know, what this all comes down to, Air Force, they're only averaging nine possessions per game with the new clock rules, and they're the most rush-heavy team in the country. But they're scoring touchdowns like every drive. And they're the most efficient passing team in the country because they've only thrown it 19 times. I think they've completed 15. Can Wyoming slow down this Air Air Force triple option attack and if so the 10 and a half looks a little bit enticing we're in a game with a total of uh 42 what do you see here well i thought you might run me off the podcast for saying this but you already mentioned it so i, I maybe i have free reign to do this i like the over in this game as everything is to, every, all the total is steaming down 41 is a huge key there is the one of the sharpest shops on the block is down at 41 if I see a 40 and a half, hey, I'll sit. This thing wants to keep coming down. But you mentioned it. Air's, Air Force has scored 17 TDs and 18 red zone trips. I mean, come on. And the total is going to be this low. So, I mean, I'm willing to wait to see if it comes down. But, you know, I mean, there are other things in here. I mean, Wyoming runs on 60% of the snaps with Harris and Whaley, four yards after contact, 12 runs of 10 plus yards. He's an explosive back. I, I mean, I didn't know if Wyoming, what kind of offense they're going to have with Peasley or if they would have any kind of run game at the beginning of the season when I took a future 13 to one on the mountain West, obviously I need this game specifically a game where they beat air force last year by three. I know that was at home. So I need some of that magic to happen here, but I'm just not a believer in air force and who they've gone up against. Look at their defensive rushing success rate numbers have come on a strength of schedule of 133. Who is air force gone up against San Diego state garbage, San Jose state garbage, Utah state rushing garbage. Sam Houston, garbage. I mean, it's Robert Morris, more garbage, right? I should I should have saved this section for you in the trash. So, I mean, none of these teams are running at a top 50 clip. So can Wyoming stop the triple? Not sure about that. I mean, they're 89th in stuff rate and, uh, you know, 96th in line yard. So the, but they do have a strength of schedule of 30. They have played a much tougher schedule. So I do like Wyoming in this game, but I'm going to veer off. I'm going to take it over as this thing steams down. I cannot get over how Air Force is just a machine in the red zone, scoring touchdowns and not ever settling for field goals. By the way, something to, to watch is uh, Harrison Whaley is a monster. He's averaging over seven yards per carry. He is questionable. He's day to day. He got hurt with like a minute to go. Um, Bowl says he's hopeful. So that's something to watch for Wyoming uh, with their star back who's averaging over seven yards per rush. By the way, you don't. I I don't even see this on the script or the list of games. Maybe you're trying to get out of it. You you like a Air Force over. San Diego State, Hawaii, fifty three and a half. Oh, we're going. To, uh, well, listen. Oh, that sounded like uh, hesitation. No, I, I mean, I mean, look. Both these teams are off of a bye. It's the same spot as last season. Hawaii's off a of bye. They lost sixteen to fourteen in Snapdragon. San Diego State lost. They've lost four straight now. Uh, Jalen Maiden's got more 10 plus yard runs than anybody else on the roster. All of the running backs combined and Hawaii's D is 97th and, and, and rushing, uh, EPA and in success rate, they're 113th and allowing the big play. And you know what they do on offense. They've been terrible since we got all those bombs against Vanderbilt. They pass on six. Jimmy Chang's got him passing on 65% of snaps and Shager, you know, he still has some pretty good TD INT big time throw turnover worthy play ratios, but he has been horrific against cover one and cover three, which is what San Diego State plays. San Diego State goes to the island. They cover late at night. I like it through seven. I'm not going to play a total here. I'm going to take San Diego State to cover that six. As a matter of fact, I think I was going to put it in here during the podcast. Are you telling me this thing is seven and a half now? Oh, no, I'm looking at the wrong game. Hold on. Yeah, it's still six. I'm taking San Diego State minus six. 
Uh, moving on to the Sun Belt, we got a good one. Noon, ESPN two. James Madison hosting Georgia Southern. Uh, I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this game because. I haven't seen or talked to anyone in the world that likes Georgia Southern except myself. I even mm-hmm. took a bad number. Now that's nine, it's going up to six. James Madison this year, and look, they've been great since coming up to FBS for the past two seasons. They had a miracle comeback against Virginia. They won by one. They beat Troy by two. They beat Utah State on a last-minute long touchdown by seven. And they beat South Alabama by one possession. Four wins all by one possession against FBS teams, net positive 30 yards. That's it. They could easily have a couple losses on the season. Meanwhile, Georgia Southern, you know, they've had four wins all by double digits and a game at Wisconsin that they lost because of six turnovers. Otherwise, they actually it was a dead even game statistically. They actually had four more yards in Wisconsin. But I actually think this is a good matchup for Georgia Southern. Why? Well, Mark, James Madison is a really good defensive front. And they're dominant against the run. I think they're only allowing like 1.3 yards per rush, which is the most uh, in the country, the lowest in the country. I think the next is 1.8. You can't run on them. Okay. Well, who cares? Georgia Southern does not run ever. They, all they do is throw. And I think this James Madison team can be attacked in the secondary. We've seen that in a couple games already this year. And on the other side of the ball, James Madison, they have some explosive passing, but they want to run to set up the pass. And that's Georgia's strengths. That's Georgia's the strength of Georgia's strength. Oh, like, easy for me to say. That's the strength of Georgia Southern's defense is against the run. They have a couple of really good defensive linemen. Uh, I think that this game sets up as a potential shootout, just like last year. Last year, in a very similar spot, I think it was right around this time of year. James Madison was undefeated. They went and they played Georgia Southern. The game ended, I think, 45 38. There was 1,300 yards of offense. Uh, so uh, I'm in a game that I think it might come down to who has the ball last in a favorable matchup for Georgia Southern. I like the Eagles Gata. I got my Georgia Southern shirt on. We're going with the Eagles at noon. Do you agree or disagree? I was pretty excited when I got onto the podcast here and we started recording. I saw you in a Georgia Southern t-shirt because this is the side that I wanted. I'll tell you what's going on in the market. Somebody at the mothership who's floating at about 47% this year, power rates this at nine and then a cert and then a tout service put it out. And that thing flew from four up to six. And I just kind of took my hands and was rubbing them together. Like, give me seven, give me seven. And so the big steam that's hitting on James Madison, they gave it a big push on Wednesday. I mean, you can kind of see it in the numbers, right? The number one defense against rush defensive havoc. They got 40 PBUs. And but, 50- but who cares about the number one D in the rush? And that's inflating their D numbers against Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern, uh, one, only one other team in the country is a uh, passes it more. It's a lower rush rate over expectation. I know. And and so people look at that stuff and they think, oh, my God, this James Madison defense is great, but that's not so much against the pass. Plus, let me mention that Georgia Southern's top 25 and Havoc allowed. They don't make a lot of mistakes and they pass 65 percent of the time. They're not going to run into the teeth of this James Madison defense. They're going to try to throw over it. But what I love, the biggest handicap of this game, why I love Georgia Southern, I'm just kind of sitting back, letting this thing float, is release time distribution by Davis Bren. That guy does not like to hold the ball. I think he held the ball way too long at Tulsa. That's not happening right now. Right now, he is well above national average in success rate in 1 to 1.5 seconds per release. I mean, he chucks everything 1 to 1.5 seconds, and he is well above success rate on anybody else in the country. And that's how you want to attack JMU. That's exactly how you want to attack JMU. You're going to throw it before anybody gets to you. He has a quarterback rating of 122 on throws between one and one and a half seconds. I think that negates the James Madison pass rush. And then you go look, and and this is what caught my attention all this, right? Because Davis Brand, we've known him at Tulsa, an A dot, an average depth of target about 11 to 14 yards over the years that he was at Tulsa. You know what it is this year? It's like 8.3. And I started thinking to myself, why the hell is Davis Brand only, is he hurt? Has he got a broken arm? Uh, No, it's because that's just how this offense runs. It is quick hitters. Boom, boom, gone. And so, you know, he is, he's well below his career average in dot, but he's so much faster in getting rid of the ball. The JMU tackle grade right now, they're 123rd, and they're dead last in standard downs explosives allowed. I couldn't even believe it when I read it. I'm staring at it right now. 133rd standard down explosives allowed. There's room here for Georgia Southern to win this game. If they're going to connect on these short passes, they're going to make it extremely quick. James Madison is just going to look like a bunch of 11 guys on Tecmo Bowl just running wild all over the place because – 
you know, I, they need to, Georgia Southern does need to fix their red zone efficiency. That makes me nervous when you have this kind of offense that throws so much, the closer you get to the end zone, less space you have to work with. So we need some of these explosive passes to turn into points. So, uh, I think Georgia Southern here is definitely the side. I kind of lean towards the under. I'm not sure if I'm going to play on the total, but I'm with you, and I hope it steams more. I hope some other tout serves that people are listening to are banging on the James Madison horn. Yeah, JMU defense, bottom 10 nationally in tackling also for PFF, and dead last in explosiveness, as you said. Um, So, yeah, I think that there's going to be some opportunities for this Georgia Southern offense, just like there was last year when they moved the ball at will against this JMU team. All right, we agree on that Sun Belt game. Let's hit one other Sun Belt game. Georgia State will host Marshall. I have a Georgia State shirt. I should go put it on. I like Georgia State here. This yeah, is good. I'm on uh, there too. Boy, it's a Sun Belt podcast here. Do you like Georgia State too? I love Georgia State in this game. Nice. Okay. So I'll make my case first. And for those new listening, we don't we talk zero before the pod. We think the pod, the pod is way better when we come in with just completely separate siloed opinions. Um Otherwise, we just have a ton of group thing. But the this is a bad, horrible spot, number one, for Marshall. Ready? Fourth straight Saturday they're playing, and they've played three hard-fought one-possession games the last three weeks, including last week in a game against NC State that was crazy all the way down to the end. Georgia State, meanwhile, coming off of a bye. Should be much fresher. And uh, so it's a bad spot. And then, by the way, Marshall also plays JMU on, I think, Wednesday or Thursday. They have a short week playing the undefeated team. So, like, there's a look-ahead factor here. I think Georgia State will come out focused after getting blown out in their last game at home here against the Marshall team in a bad situational spot. And Georgia State's pretty simple handicap. You got to look. Everything starts with the run for them. Like one of the reasons that we love Troy is because Troy can shut down the run. But you can get, you can hit run explosiveness against Marshall. And that's a bad, that's bad news. Uh, when you're going up against Georgia State with Granger and Carroll. Uh, for what it's worth, Georgia State's offense, it's, it's comp- completely relying on explosiveness. They're sixth in overall explosiveness, second on rushing plays. Marshall, seventh worst on defense and explosiveness, dead last in explosiveness on rushing plays. Dead last against second. So Georgia State's going to hit a ton of big rushing plays. On the other side of the ball, Georgia State's run D is good. And everything Marshall wants to do starts with the Rasheen Ali. And their secondary is weak, and you can get them. But I just don't trust Cam Fancher to consistently beat them down the field without making a couple key mistakes. So give me Georgia State at home as a now small favorite. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you here. Marshall's off their first loss of the season to NC State. Georgia State's off their bye week, their first loss of the season to Troy, 28-7. to But this is a completely different defense they're going up with. Now, you mentioned Georgia State's heavy rush attack. I don't care about Marshall's pass defense numbers. They're good, but it doesn't matter here. Georgia State's heavy rush attack starts with Marcus Carroll, 3.2 yards after contact. He's got nine TDs on the season, 17 runs of 10 yards or more. Georgia State is second in the nation in rush explosives behind Kentucky. They are absolutely going to get eight yards per carry on first down in this game. Why? And Granger's going to, Carroll's going to have like a 60, 70 yard, or Granger's going to have like, you know, 30, 40 yard scrambles. Yep. Georgia State, second in the country in standard downs explosives. That's all on the ground. That means to me, they're going to get five to eight to maybe more yards rushing the ball on first down. Marshall, 131st defensively and allowing explosives and standard downs. They do not know what to do with themselves when the opposing offense is on schedule. Plus, there is a monster, monster gap in special teams between these two teams. Uh, I am happily going to take Georgia State here. They have it in a lot of the kicking game. They have it in the punting game. They have it field position game. They have it everywhere, and they're going to rush themselves all the way to victory here. All right, good stuff there. Sunbelt consensus. Always love to see it. QB updates that we won't talk about the rest of the show. Leonard, keep Riley Leonard for Duke, keep an eye on his status. Bob Tech looks like they're going to go with drones. Vandy looks like Seals. Kansas looks like Bean. Cal looks like Mendoza. Arizona, Delora, questionable. TCU's going with Josh Hoover with the injury there. Navy Horvath's out. They're going with Labatai. Plenty of experience there. Oklahoma State looks like they're sticking with Bowman. Miss State is for next week. Rogers is hurt. 
keep an eye on his status. Virginia Musket Musket hurt his shoulder. They have a bye. And Tony Elliott came out and said they want to keep Calandria's red shirt. So if Musket can't go, you're down to some guy in Broster House or something. Something worth just n- jotting down. You UCF Plumley's knee just didn't feel right last week. They play Oklahoma next week. Keep an eye on his status. Um, but there's a quick quarterback update. Listen, Colin, you know what everyone loves? Compliments. And compliments are guaranteed after making the leap to skincare with Caldera Lab. And I'm talking about how you look today and 20 years from now. The results are incredible in little time. Men's skincare and Caldera Lab are the perfect pair for you to look and feel your best. Super easy to add to your morning and nightly routine. Clear skin, less wrinkles and signs of aging. Enough said. Caldera Lab skincare. Join the other 100,000 men who trust Caldera Lab to show your best first impression this fall. Now, Caldera Lab knows the skincare world is heavily female-driven and has long been the wild, wild west for men. That's why they're making the solution simple with just three steps. The clean slate, which is a face wash to start and end your day. The base layer, which is a daily moisturizer to hydrate your skin. And the good which is an eye serum you can put on at night to help your skin look tight, tighter and smoother. And just for our, our audience, we have an exclusive deal. Use code ACTION at calderalab.com and get 20% off right now. That's 20% off with code ACTION at caldera, C-A-L-D-E-R-A, lab.com. Make unforgettable first impressions with Caldera Lab. I can say that I, uh, they sent me some. I love it. Um, I really like the eye serum too. I just I don't I don't, like basically just don't sleep for six months and can wake up my eyes before uh, seeing people or doing stuff like this. All right, let's move on to some trash, baby. Got lots of trash. I will say this is the my trashiest card of my entire life. I saw the list. So so this I'm going to run through them. And by the way, I would say this to people out there. I haven't had a bad Saturday, bad losing Saturday in two years. It's going to happen soon. It's coming. I know it. Could be this weekend. And number one, if you can't afford to like go two and 10, you're betting too much. Number two, if you are going to tilt and just be miserable losing by betting on a bunch of horrendous teams, because some of some of these – you're gonna. It's gonna be awful, right? It's gonna be an awful viewing experience. You're gonna know it's over after the first quarter. If you're not comfortable with that. Just pick one or two out. You don't have to tail every bet. Um, I've been doing this for two decades. Um, I bet the worst of the worst. I'm a glutton for punishment. It doesn't bother me. Um, I've had an 0 and 18 Saturday before. Um, I've bet on the worst teams that you can ever imagine. Uh, so let's start it off. Uh, there's a theme here, and the theme that you'll see a lot is I'm fading the top teams in the country that are laying huge numbers that play slow and with the new clock rules make it pretty difficult to cover these big numbers, which is why top five teams against the spread have struggled in the non-conference this year. So let's start off with Vanderbilt, a team that's 0 and 7 against the spread, plus 31 and a half against Georgia. Look, Vanderbilt is is awful. They have an awful defense. The offense is pretty good. Uh, they've been unlucky with turnovers. Looks like Ken Seals is going to get the start. But Vandy, look, they haven't covered yet, but they've been close. Like they've had bad turnover luck. They, they've given up a couple late scores. This is a team that could can score a couple touchdowns. Georgia is slow, methodical. And what have we seen from Georgia all year? They don't care, right? They got up last week. They got up last week for Kentucky. Before that, they didn't cover. They didn't cover a game. So these are two teams that just were burning money. What? Why would Georgia show up here? Why would they not be complacent? Noon kick. There's probably like a 1,000 people there. They'll be all be Georgia fans. In Nashville against a horrendous Vandy team. Um, by the way, last year, this, this price... Georgia was minus 37 at home against Vandy. A historically dominant Georgia team. Now I can get 31 and a half. This is the bottom of the market on Vandy, in my opinion. Uh, they have enough offense 
to score a couple touchdowns. And it wouldn't even shock me if they cover without scoring. This game ends like 30 to nothing. This line's too high. I'm just trusting that what I've seen all year, Georgia's going to go back to sleep. The next time they have to be woken up, we'll get their best effort. But they showed up for the after they slept walk, called out. How can you not? It's at night against an undefeated Kentucky team between the hedges. So what do I expect in this game? Look, Georgia could win 55 nothing. But what do I expect in this game? Vandy's up 7 nothing, like with eight, 8 to go in the first quarter. Agree or disagree? What really scares me is that last year's game, Georgia purposely was asleep and hibernating. It was 28-0 at halftime. And they came out in the third quarter, and they did everything that they could to just say, we're done with this game. They only scored six points. Then Vanderbilt screwed themselves and helped Georgia score three touchdowns in the fourth quarter, and Kirby Smart was not trying to drive it up. 55-0 was the final score. So I think the question becomes, how much havoc allowed is there going to be? How much will they hurt themselves here? This is not the same havoc-minded defense that was around last year for Georgia. So I can back you in the fact that I think that this Vanderbilt team is not going to hurt themselves as bad. A.J. Swan is out. I don't know how much. I, I think it really comes down to how often are you going to spot Georgia field position in your own territory. Um, the number's too high. All right, I get it. The number's too high. I'll give you that. I think I'm going to let you roll with this one. I got a couple on this I want to take. It won't be this one. All right, let's move on. Let's fade uh, another top five undefeated team. Let's go with Indiana. Plus 34 at Michigan. Michigan, earlier this year, they were favored by 36, 38, and 40 in the non-con. They never even scored that many points. They scored 30, 35, and 31. I get that they've scored 40 and 45 the past two weeks. They were gifted points in a lot of those. The new clock rules, the way that Michigan operates, they just get so few possessions. And Indiana, what what is Indiana going to do? They're going to take away the explosive play. And that's what they did against Ohio State. They held Ohio State to, what, 23? Um, they held Louisville to 21 and in games that were just ugly grinders. All, t- all of this will take to cover this number. And by the way, Michigan could win 30 nothing. Like Indiana could not score and cover this game, just like Georgia Vandy. It'll just take like a Michigan pick, a Michigan fumble in the red zone. That's it. And this is a decent spot for Indiana coming off of a bye, two weeks to prepare, and you fired your offensive coordinator, Walt Bell, stock up. They can only get better. You're going to have element of surprise. Your big play wide receiver, I think, is going to come back this week. And, you know, you got Rod Carey's first game calling plays. Michigan doesn't really know what to expect. You also brought in Justin Fuente. I think it's a good offensive mind, bad uh, head coach. So I I think I think Indiana can find a way to get to like seven to 10. And I, that's all this will take. Um, as long as they're not, you know, giving Michigan big, uh, you know, pick sixes and, and things of that nature for what it's worth. And this applies to a lot of these bets, tiny sample size, but ranked favorites of 30 or more this year. I think they were 78% against the spread last year, six and 13 against the spread against FBS opponents, 31%. And I think that speaks to the clock rules. So this number's too high for me. Indiana, noon. Michigan could come out a little sleepy here, too. Uh, Give me the Hoosiers. Yeah, I like the first half under. I like the Michigan team total under. And one thing that is sticking out to me week after week after week is the fact that Michigan's strength of schedule is 111th, and for some reason they cannot figure it out with explosive ball. They, I mean, they are 102nd in standard downs explosives. They're 60th in passing down explosives, although they are not in passing downs very often. It doesn't matter. Just go look at the overall EPA numbers, 118th rush, 60th in the pass. You say, well, they haven't had to open it up yet. They haven't had to do that to anybody. They're not proving it. They're not showing it. At least some of these teams that are playing their 30-point favorites, at least they're having explosive plays. Michigan is not. So I like the under. I like the Michigan team total under. Hopefully you can get this Indiana cover. Uh, So let's fade a third Top five undefeated team at noon. What are you doing here? I got to hear what you're – I saw this. What are you doing here? Uh, We're going Purdue against Ohio State. Oh, I thought you were doing UMass. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that's coming next. That's at 3.30. Purdue plus 19.5. I haven't put this in the app yet, so I'm waiting just to see if it ticks up to 20. It's kind of in a dead zone right now. I don't think it's going to get there, but it's worth waiting. Um, Purdue's offense is getting better. 
I think their defense is also improving. Like, it's not a great defense. I'm a little worried about their slow-footed secondary, but Ryan Walters I have a lot of respect for. And this is a sleepy spot for Ohio State. This is Purdue's big the spoiler makers. This is their biggest game of the year at home. Ohio State just survived Maryland. They have Penn State coming up. So it could be flat here. And I just don't think Ohio State is that great. Yeah. After a bye, they had 10 points midway through the third quarter against Maryland at home. And it, 10 of them, it was a pick six. We're seven of the 10 points. Against Notre Dame, they should have scored 10 points if Notre Dame was to drop a pick. And by the way, the Notre Dame, the game, that, that winner versus Notre Dame looks worse and worse, even though they should have lost. Uh, this Purdue team is feisty enough with Hudson Card and that offense, and he's going to have time. Uh, it, Ohio State defense has improved, but he can find enough receivers here. And Ohio State's getting no pressure. And the fact that they couldn't get any pressure against Notre Dame, um, and the fact that they couldn't, they can't run the ball either. It, uh, McCord is just looks lost in the pocket. The offensive line has issues. They can't run the ball either. It's this Ohio State team has issues. Uh, this number's too high. I, I just this number should be like two touchdowns. Oh, I, I, mean, make I make it 15. I make it 15. I'm with you. The number's going the other way, so I'm waiting. So this is one that I am hitting with you with on Purdue. And I will say this: Ohio State's gonna drop one. Now, do they drop one that they shouldn't drop? Are they dropping this one on the road against Purdue? Or are they going to go play Penn State and Wisconsin over the following two weeks and then drop at Rutgers on November 4th? I don't know. But they're dropping one that they shouldn't drop. And it might be this one. I'm going to be with you on this after it gets done steam, and I'll, I'll probably take a 20. I'd take a 19. but And I don't see it in the analytics how Purdue is going to pull this off. But at the same time, Ohio State is a shell of who they used to be. And yeah, spoiler makers all the way. This is usually the team. This is usually the helmet that drives it out of them. But you know what? Rutgers is playing some feisty ball too, but somebody's going to get to Ohio State that shouldn't. All right, let's fade a fifth or fourth top five team that's undefeated. What's... We're going to UMass, baby. Back to the Minutemen. Plus 40. I, this number's come down since I bet it. I still like it. Here's another game where UMass could cover without scoring. But for what it's worth, UMass's offense has been good. I like they're they're putting up 500 yards every week, and I, like they they also should have a couple more wins, and I think they'd get a little more respect in the market. They lost to EMU in a last minute touchdown. They outgained them by like 200 200 yards. They lost to overtime to New Mexico. They outgained them by like 100 yards. Um, so the offense now, but and they they've had quarterback injuries too. Kumachan's back. Are they going to do anything against this elite Penn State defense? I don't know. I think they can get a touchdown. Um, and that's all I think it'll take. This Penn State offense, by the way, they have Ohio State next. I know James Franklin will probably do a fake knee with the backup third string punter and throw a Hail Mary, double reverse Hail Mary to cover at the end. But Penn State's offense is the most methodical, boring, and I think they're just not showing anything. Yep. And James Franklin's clip of being asked, like, why aren't you throwing downfield was pretty funny, his response. But they are so boring. Like, they just march down the field, they don't make any mistakes. They take up so much time. Uh, so, like, with the new clock rules, such a good chance they win this game, like, 35-0. Um, so this is just is too high for a team. There's no explosiveness right now. I don't know if that's by design or – but they're it, – like, with the new clock rules in this spot with Ohio State on deck, even James Franklin has to like, – we're not showing anything. we got to worry about our health in the second half. This is this number is too high. It's UMass. 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 I think we might – there also could be some weather. Uh, I could be making that up, but um, – I don't want to throw poo-poo in your trash segment, but I mean – and I took under 58 on open. I'm happy with that. But this is the coach that knows the spread, that does what he has to do in the last series of the game to get a cover. Now, there's going to be some heavy rain here, right? You're right. I mean, this could be a scoreless game. It's going to be 35-0. This could be 40-0. to zero. I, That would still be a cover here. Um, I'm not positive that UMass can get a score up on the board. I think the heavy weather really favors Penn State here, especially on the defensive side, what they're able to do. Um, but uh, I think the better play is probably the under in this game. But I'm not sure. If I, don't, I don't mind. I don't mind the under. For what it's worth, I have 43, which is pretty big in this game. If you want to wait to see if you can get a 42, because like could be seven. You know, if you get six Penn State touchdown drives and UMass doesn't score. Yeah, it's forty-two nothing. Um, I, have so I would wait. 
I have James Franklin PTSD. I I mean, good luck to you. But here's the thing: if you could get 43, see if you can get a 43. Because then if it if it I have 43, so if it closes at 41, Franklin's just trying to cover that number. The the close, I think. I don't know. All right. Um, what if he's kicking a field goal with driving rain? <laughs> just up, to cover up up uh, 49 to 10. Yeah. Um. All right. Uh. Let's keep it going. Let's. I don't think it gets as ugly. Um, I got, can't so believe Mandy, that you picked this team. I can't believe Mandy, that you're going to bet UMass Purdue. We're going to be Bielema, baby. I can't. My believe. guy, Brett Bielema. It's time to buy. I trashed this team all year. Two touchdowns is too much. This line is too high. Uh, this is look. Illinois has running back injuries, but I actually like their young guys. They also, they also should get their guards back this week. Bielema. When you want to bet them, you want to bet them as a big dog with the way they want to play. They want to ugly up the game. And Maryland's historically struggled at the spot after playing, you know, Ohio State in a pretty heartbreaking loss. They've been so inconsistent, too. Like, they've had these horrible halves against teams. They're 5-13-1 against the spread after playing teams ranked inside the top 10 over the past uh, 15 years for what it's worth. But I project this closer to 10. I hate everything about this Illinois team. They're 0-6 against the spread. I think this is the bottom. I'm I'm gonna buy it. Uh, you can run on Maryland. That's what Illinois wants to do. And Illinois has been the unluckiest team in the country in terms of field position. I think they're, you know, it's deflating some of its numbers on both sides of the ball. Um, so yeah, I think this is too high, buy low spot. After Maryland lost that game stylistically, this is when you want to back Burt. Illinois also had an extra day of prep and rest. For what it's worth, Brett Bielema, my guy. Nine and two against the spread as an underdog of more than a field goal, covering by over 10 points per game at Illinois. Six and oh on the road. Burt will ugly this up. Illinois will stay within two touchdowns, get its first cover of the year. Uh, Illinois, 113th havoc allowed. They kill themselves all the time. Maryland somehow 16th in havoc allowed. Usually they do that. So I'm going to stay off with you. I've got. I, You've been betting you Burt all year. Now you're not. No, I mean, come on, come on over to Saturday morning where you see what my record is on the show. And I think I've had Bert twice on there. Like, I mean, it just is not worked out well. I, I'm the Bert. I'm the Bert whisperer. It's time. <laughs> uh, lastly, we're going to get, this might be the ugliest of them all. And I already have Vandy, Indiana, UMass, Purdue, and Illinois. Pitt, we're going Pitt. Uh, it's time to buy Pitt. This is the spot of, this is the spot of the weekend. Uh, off a of buy, taking a Louisville team that just came off an emotional win against Notre Dame. It's a playing a bunch of close games for a while for what it's worth Louisville. I, I just, what is their body of work? Like you beat Notre Dame in, in the best spot of the season an exhausted Notre Dame team that decided to shuffle in offensive linemen and out the whole game and turned it over five times. What is your other body work? You needed a goal line stand to beat Indiana. You uh, beat NC state because Brandon Armstrong, who's now bench was throwing ducks by the way, that Indiana team has since fired their offensive coordinator. I, I mean, like, this team has not been in bed. You could have lost to Georgia Tech, a team that has since fired the defensive coordinator or demoted them. Like what? It, what their resume looks awful. This is a this is a team that is, it's they're going to get picked off soon. I know their schedule's easy. Pitt coming off by made a quarterback change, going with the Penn State transfer. Hard to know what you're going to get, but this is the time to buy Pitt. Um, and Narduzzi, this is a classic Narduzzi spot. They they seem to get one of these a year against a ranked team. And Narduzzi's nine and two against the spread with 10 or more days between games, covering by over a touchdown per game for what it's worth. Quarterback change. They made some other changes on the offensive depth chart. It's time to buy Pitt and fade Louisville. Yeah, I have a 35 to one on Louisville, have an undefeated season. I totally expect it to go down right here. I power rate this game at six and a half. So, of course, I think it's too high. I will join you on this one. Uh, we'll call it an emotional and a financial hedge on a ticket that I didn't think would last past Notre Dame. All right, there you have it, the trash. Vandy, Indiana, UMass, Purdue, Illinois, and Pitt. I will either look really smart or really stupid, but I'm used to that, so who cares? All right, uh, but I hope they, I hope, I hope five cash. Let's go five and one. Um, but could go 0 and six. If you're not ready for that and you don't want to lose all your money on bad teams, then just don't follow. You can laugh at me if they lose. All right, uh, before we get out of here. Oh, wait, by the way, you're 30 second. Uh, you must be really avoiding this game. He didn't put this is not on a list that of games you sent me. Alabama, Arkansas. Yeah. 
30 seconds go yeah we're gonna go the over on this game uh this is an arkansas offense that is boomer bust they either have a bunch of sacks with kj starting off third and 15 third and 20 and then they have ex- pass explosives they can't keep kj jefferson clean all that offensive line shuffling they did they went back to it in the second half it didn't work either uh, that's going to turn into some scores here, but it's also going to turn into excellent field position for Alabama, who's going to get some cheap scores. But on the Alabama side, I cannot get over how great Jalen Milrow was throwing the ball, 323 yards, throwing three TDs against a pretty good Texas A&M defense. Uh, if you think that Texas A&M isn't capable of keeping Jalen Milrow in the pocket and letting him run around, what do you think Arkansas's offense is going to do with this heavy, aggressive, um, you know, 40% blitz sending six, seven guys that is going to turn out to be a disaster. I know this number keeps shooting down. haven't been able to figure out why. Uh, I mean, everybody's healthy, but I am going to take the over in this game. I would love a 45, but we'll just keep sitting here, watch it. And I'll be happy to go over 46 and a half. If that's what's there. Arkansas cover. Yes or no. Yes. Okay. Uh, Friday, uh, before we get out of here, let's go three and out. All right, let's start first down. We got it. Friday night lights, three games here. Tulane at Memphis. I'm a market disagrees with me, but I like Memphis here. Yeah, what's this? Uh, what's this number doing? Why is this number moving so much? I don't know. No, uh, no one's hurt. Pratt's not hurt. Hennigan's not hurt. I, I don't understand what this move was at all. Yeah, let's see. It is. Yeah, it's up to four and a half. I, I like anything a field goal or above. Yeah. Um, and. I like the matchup for Memphis. You can throw in this two lane team. You can't run on them, but that Memphis really wants to just have Hennigan move the ball down the field methodically through the air. Tulane can't run the ball, which is how you can attack this Memphis D. They're terrible so, in the red zone. They're terrible in the red zone. Yeah. So, and the part of that is their run, their run issues. They don't have spears anymore. So I think it's going to be closer to pick. I like Memphis. Fresno State at Utah State. Backup Under. quarterbacks going up against each other. Although Legas was the starter, now he's going to be starting again because Hildebrand is hurt. Looks like Mikey Keene's out for Fresno. That means Logan Fife, who stinks, will start. Shout out to Mike Ionello on the G5 guys. I, they, uh, I think Ionello thinks he's a better quarter, quarterback than uh, Cooper Lagos. So, uh, yeah, we got some pretty – I took the under in this game. I have no, no feel in that game. And then Stan, you agree on uh, Memphis, right? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, and then Stanford of Colorado, I like, I like Stanford. Um, I think Ashton Daniels should be good to go. This Colorado team, again, all these games in a row, now a short week. Stanford off of a bye with brand new offense and a good staff. I think they'll figure some things out. And Colorado just profiles a horrible favor. Never take Colorado as a favor. They they know they can't run the ball and they play no defense. So like they could be up 20 and I wouldn't be that scared. Stanford, Stanford's aside here. Yeah, full right up over at Action Network. I said, tell everybody, let's bet on the under. I bet the under on 59. I'd do it again at 60. Uh, I'll let you guys go read it, but these teams are 114th and 118th in offensive momentum killer rate, which means how many 10-yard penalties, turnovers, sacks. These two offenses are terrible at it. Plus, I love that Travis Hunter's back. I think that helps Colorado defense. I like the under in this one. All right, moving on to second down, our favorite overdog or favorite favorite. Uh, I'm going to go South Carolina at home against Florida, a team that can't win on the road. Uh, We've seen it over and over again. They even lost at Vandy last year. They lost at South Carolina two years ago by, I think, 30. South Carolina is trying to avenge an embarrassing loss. They've talked about it for a while. They're coming off a bye here. Shane Beamer, for what it's worth, 3-0 against the spread off of a bye. His teams have all won outright against SEC teams as underdogs. Uh, And look, I'm fading Graham Mertz on the road at under a field goal. Happily did it with Kentucky. We'll happily do it again here with South Carolina. Should be a, a little bit healthier. They've dealt with a lot of injuries. Young offensive line has needed time to gel, so I think the two weeks will do them some good. Uh, I like South Carolina. I'll take the better quarterback at home in a good spot against a Florida team that can't win on the road. They're talking about it. They're trying to do all things different. Napier's uh, – it's a mess. Give me South Carolina. You? Yeah, I'm going to go with Utah here. There is uh, a very strong – uh sense that cam rising might be back for this game uh of course you'll never get anything out of the utah coaches you'll never get anything out of kyle whittingham but um the word on the street is that he is actually going to play in this game that completely changes the dynamic of the utah offense against a cal defense 
that is near dead last against the pass. They don't create any havoc whatsoever. And they're 130th in defensive finishing drives. Whether Cam Rising plays or not, anybody is scoring maximum points in scoring position against this Cal defense. And plus, Utah defense, one of the best in the nation uh, from every single metric. And they should be able to contain anything that Cal's got on the offensive side. Uh, so let's see if Cam Rising plays. Um, I project this 15 with him playing. This is a 10 and a half, 11 right now. I suspect it takes no drop if he's not announced playing. So let's go ahead and take Utah. One final test, third down, our favorite money line underdogs. Uh, I'll kick things off, but go Pitt. Uh, it's classic Narduzzi spot, great situational spot, new quarterback, which creates some variance here, which I like with a bigger money line underdog. A lot of uncertainty. What is the offense going to look like? It can only be better, but uh, it's also just a great situational spot here against uh, a fraudulent Louisville team that should have a couple of losses in its back pocket. Coming off a big game, huge win over Notre Dame. Meanwhile, Pitt coming off the bye, made some changes on the offense. Uh, I think the Panthers have a good shot of picking off Louisville here in a great situational spot. Where are you going? Yeah, I think UCLA can do the unthinkable and go in and beat Jonathan Smith and the Oregon State team. And this UCLA defense has been fantastic under Danton Lynn, uh, the defensive coordinator they hired from the Ravens staff, sort of that model that Michigan has had the last couple of years. It has shown in the advanced numbers for UCLA. Latu Latu is one of the best defensive edges in the nation. Nearly 30 pressures already, 18 quarterback hurries. Uh, they are stout no matter what down and distance it is. And I know everyone wants to focus on the mistakes that Dante Moore has had. Yes, he is a freshman, uh, but they have to give him maximum playing time because the rumor on the street is that he will leave and transfer somewhere else. But he's got it in the advanced numbers. 15 big-time throws to six turnover-worthy plays. His struggles really come against cover three. Oregon State doesn't run cover three. They always run quarters. I expect Dante Moore to have one of his best games of the season in terms of going through the air. Plus, opponents are creating explosives against on the ground against Oregon State at a huge rate. Beavers are outside the top 100 and tackling their defensive rushing success rate is outside the top 100 they allow 19 first downs a game i think ucla is methodical and explosive they shut them down on defense give me the bruins all right good stuff there by the way do a couple giveaways kurt parr my favorite college football podcast leave a five-star review they really help us out you can say whatever you want um even this guy, Fish7507, the guys do their homework on the games, but when they give out picks, take the opposite. I mean, you're not going to find a podcast that has given out more winners over the past two seasons than this one. So I don't, uh, but. But by the way, no one else is tracking either. No one else has a, no one else has an app that ho makes you, that holds you, you know, I I know yeah. that there's other. And no one else listens to voicemails getting yelled at for any losing picks. Yeah, no uh, I will tell you that. But I, over the last two years, I've hit about 63%. You're saying that now. I've had some seasons where that would be a warranted comment. Oh, by the um, way, we can't delete our plays in the app either. There are other tracking apps where their experts delete their play. We can't do that. I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean, what you see in there is legit. Uh, Frank Dahl, Colin and Stucky are great. Used to sit out Saturdays because I thought college football was too hard to bet. Finding the show has opened up my weekend. Also came up huge last year during bowl season. Can't tell these guys enough. Cannot wait. Truly valuable service to the generation. nation. Yep, can't wait for bowl season always tends to be profitable for the podcast. Uh, MHK, Ron, great analysis. Really fun to listen to. Best part every Monday. They eat crap for every pick they get wrong. Thank you, MHK, Ron. Oh, anyone I'm listening, just reach out to me or our producer, Matt Mitch. We'll get you some gear. Boss3287, I love it. You guys are always spot on, and it's a fun show. Marlo8201, listen to Wednesday's deep dive for the first time. Very good breakdown. Keep it up, guys. Thank you. Reach out. Juicer. I have learned more from Colin and Stucky in their six years of podcast and I have my entire scholastic career, and that includes grad school. These guys have taught me so much. They're must listen. Love that. It really helps us out. Uh, make sure you subscribe, unsubscribe, subscribe, tell a friend, tell an enemy. Also, don't forget with hockey season starting, check out Line Change, Action Network's hockey betting podcast for everything you need to bet the NHL season. Love the crew we have assembled for that. That'll do it for us. We will be back. Saturday, 10.30 a.m. Eastern live for the Week 7 BBOC live show. We'll tweet out that link. It'll be on YouTube and in the app with myself, Colin, and Brett McMurphy. We will then have the recap episode, which will be out by Monday morning. Make sure you leave voicemails. Yell at me for all the trash that gets annihilated. 959, bad beat. Yell whatever you want, and uh, we'll play those back. And then we'll be back next week, Week 8. Uh, group of five guys will be back. It's 
an exciting time of the year. Hope everyone is stay safe, enjoys the weekend, and picks a lot of winners. But enjoy the weekend, and we'll catch you all later. Cheers. He's out.